Okay, good afternoon everybody and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, the Mid-Year MSHA and Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission Review. Uh, my name is Nick Scala. I will be your host today. I am the uh, chair of the National Practice Group or M National MSHA Practice Group at Con Mafiel Carey. Uh, we're a boutique law firm that specializes in labor and employment and workplace safety litigation. Um, primarily in my practice, I, I represent companies in litigation with the Department of Labor, uh, be that OSHA and MSHA. And so that's kind of a start to finish uh, MSHA service. I work with companies through all levels of compliance, audits, and investigations, uh, as well as litigation before the Federal Mine Self Safety and Health Review Commission. Um, so today, what we want to talk about are a couple items. We want to talk about MSHA updates, so what's been happening at the agency as we are now in August of 2019 uh, and very near to the end of the fiscal year for MSHA. Um, in terms of that, we're also going to look at what do they have on their agenda at MSHA for rulemaking initiatives. Uh, and then after that, we are going to look at some updates from the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission. We have, for the first time in uh, almost uh, six to eight months, a full commission, a uh, full of five commissioners, as well as some legal decisions that have come out in the last year that are of interest for us in the mining industry. So to begin, uh, what is a topic that is getting a lot of attention from the agency and from operators around the country? And if you've been to any of the mining associations or mining conferences in the last 12 months, you've probably seen someone from MSHA there touting their one MSHA program. Uh, and this is, as they're referring to it, a blurring um, between the metal, non-metal, and coal divisions. And that just means they're merging them. Uh, there is since the existence of MSHA, been two distinct divisions within their enforcement and really in their administrative structure, and that is the coal and metal non-metal divisions. Now, what they are doing is they're merging that in order to really realign a lot of the resources that were previously being devoted to the coal industry that no longer are needed, um, as the coal industry has reduced in its size and Correspondingly, it's demand for MSHA resources and attention. Um, so that has continued. They have rolled it out uh, as of last October, where there were inspections taking place at metal non-metal mines around the country uh, by coal districts and coal inspectors. Uh, they've been doing some cross-training with these individuals before sending them out, and eventually we will also see metal non-metal inspectors, or traditionally metal non-metal inspectors, be going into coal mines as well. But for the most part, it has been a transfer from coal into the metal non-metal sector. Um, this is, means that mines or specific regions are being reassigned. Uh, you may have been provided notice, especially if you're in that Ohio River Valley uh, or central kind of Midwestern area where coal and metal non-metal are both very prevalent, uh, of a reassignment of districts or reassignment of field offices. And that is taking place because MSHA is now assigning mines uh, that have historically been under a field office that might be an hour or two hours away uh, to whatever field office is nearest. And that might be one in the formerly coal division or metal non-metal division. So this has been received in mixed results, um, both externally and internally at the agency. Uh, you know, we are seeing some confusion uh, with regard to application of standards, but nothing that has been too egregious yet uh, with the attempts by coal inspectors to put citations under coal standards at metal non-metal mines. Um, we're trying to fit into a situation there. A lot of the issue has been, in my experience, with <clears throat> concerns over ground control, control conditions. Uh, and this continues to be something that operators are having issue with, where you have a coal inspector uh, coming into a hard rock mine and having some significant disagreements regarding abatement requirements. Uh, and just the overall status of what the inspector determines to be a hazard regarding ground control. Um, 
So that's something that we want to be very careful of monitoring because it is both an important area and also one that can carry significant fines and significant enforcement because it is a high hazard uh, or a highly hazardous condition if it is accurate. So that, that is one area that we're seeing uh, some issues with it. But overall, we have been getting more and more of this blurring taking place. On the litigation side, if you contest citations or you work with someone who is contesting citations for you, uh, you might be aware that MSHA is reassigning a lot of their conference litigation representatives. And part of that is now coal conference and litigation representatives are handling a lot of metal, non-metal cases. I think that is going to provide uh, its own set of challenges as we move forward. Um, it is something that has just really started over the course of this summer, uh, and we're continuing to see that transition take place. Um, but I can just say from my own personal experience, you know, it has one setback of several, you know, on more than one occasion, the progress that you are making with the existing CLR, but we'll, you know, obviously move past that. But now you have someone who is focused entirely on coal regulations having to make adjustments to metal, non-metal, um, or at least consider making adjustments to metal, non-metal. And that is, uh, is that's proving to be something that's taking a lot more effort on the part of the operators in order to move that process forward. Um, just from a real administrative standpoint, uh, there is now an administrator of mine safety and health enforcement um, over both coal and metal, non-metal. His name is Tim Watkins at MSHA. He has historically been on the coal side. Now he's over both. Uh, on the coal side, there is an acting deputy administrator, and that is David Weaver. He was previously the district manager in the Western, or I'm sorry, the Rocky Mountain District. Uh, he has since been recalled to headquarters and is the acting deputy administrator for coal mine safety. Uh, there's also a deputy administrator for metal non-metal mine safety, and that is Brian Gofert. And uh, so those are kind of your power structure with regards to the top three people in terms of the enforcement and admin side, and especially being those kind of career MSHA persons, not the political appointees like Assistant Secretary Zetezolo um, and Ed Elliott, who is a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary, uh, and Wayne Palmer. Those are all political appointees, so they could change in this there is a changing administration, um, or even if there's not a changing administration. The career people that are over those divisions though, are more likely to be a constant uh, in the next few years. There's also been developments, if you are familiar with MSHA's Mine Data Retrieval System, and now this should be a very, a resource that we're familiar with because it is one of the best resources that we can have in order to review our own mine history. Uh, and look at trends at our facility, whether that be trends in what is issued, trends in how SNSs are issued, if they are, or trends in when MSHA, you know, tends to come out on their regular and periodic inspections. Um, you know, if you've been part of uh, our other webinars through the years, you've most likely heard me refer to the Mind Data Retrieval System as one of your best resources, and I encourage all of you to use it if you are not. Um, but what MSHA has done is taken this historic or their original system and rolled out a brand new one. And I say, I will say, you know, there are a lot of very nice features and very interesting features in this new system. Uh, you can now download reports and data sets. You can somewhat be a much, or be much more specific uh, in what you're searching and the data that you're seeking. You can also use this new mine data retrieval system to ascertain um, industry-wide data sets, uh, which previously we had to rely on MSHA to publish. So there are some very nice features. If you are familiar with it or if you've tried to use it, it is not nearly as user-friendly right now. Um, and perhaps that's just because we're all used to the old system and trying to figure it out. Uh, but there has been... Um, you know, a fair amount of negative feedback from industry, at least when I've been engaging with the industry, about how this system is a bit more difficult to operate. So MSHA has put out some tools uh, in order to help you familiarize yourself with it, a user manual, I think there might even be a video. Um, 
but you know, I, I would recommend if you're going to be digging into that new mine data retrieval system, you look at those resources and how to operate it because it is, it is not quite as easy to maneuver and move through as the previous one. Uh, but as I said, there are some nice features in terms of the data you can collect. And this is just an example of one data set um, that previously MG used to put out on an annual basis, and it was sometime around this time of year, maybe a little earlier, uh, but it was the safety and data report for the entire year. Um, and this is just looking at all mine safety and health. So this numbers that are up on the screen right now include both the coal metal, coal and metal non-metal safety and health statistics. Um, you know, it is worth mentioning as part of this blurring, you're starting to see that delineation uh, be removed. Uh, for example, in the MSHA section of the website that addresses uh, fatal, fatal injuries or fatal incidents, uh, that is no longer broken down into metal, non-metal, and coal uh, on that home screen, uh, but just mine-related fatalities. So that is part of their initiative to make it all mine safety and health as opposed to coal mine and metal, non-metal. Uh, but nonetheless, you can do a lot of interesting features in terms of a comparison on multiple years. Um, you can see in the left-hand column, you can select which years you want to compare. I just did the last three, um, and you can tell that there you know, has been a bit of a drop-off in the number of mines this year by roughly 1,000, um, a little less. The miners has uh, increased from 2017 to 2018, but they don't put out the data on that for 2019 uh, until the end of the year. Similarly, a, they are doing a updating as they go on the fatalities for 2019, and we are, you know, much less than, or several less than half of what we were in 2018 and 2017, and we're more than halfway through the year. That is a, an excellent stride for the industry, uh, and the industry should be proud of that. Obviously, we're always going for zero, uh, but there has been significant drop-offs in the uh, fatal injury rate uh, now going on uh, pretty consistently for the last decade. Um, we can also see that there is data on the injury rates, whether uh, the inspection hours, the number of citations and orders issued, as well as the SNS rates uh, and the dollars and penalties that were issued. So there is some interesting data that can be acquired from this, and it can be acquired pretty readily uh, if you're familiar with the system. One piece of information that was missing from that that I always found personally to be an interesting uh, statistic was the number of elevated actions issued in metal, non-metal, and coal. Um, I always thought that was an interesting little item that MSHA used to publish so you could tell you know, what areas were getting the most elevated actions, being 104G orders, 104D orders, uh, 104B orders, or 107As. Um, that was not included on that last data set. Uh, and, you know, hopefully they will uh, revise the system to include that. Another area that has been getting significant um, attention by MSHA is their scoff law program. And hopefully no one on this webinar has been uh, party to it or even has to know what it is, but the scoff law program is MSHA's push to collect delinquent penalties. Um, if you do not pay your fines uh, in a timely fashion or you just do not pay them at all, to, they have been, they will be registered with MSHA as a delinquent. And historically, those have just gone into the cycle of going to creditors uh, who will then try to collect it and back to MSHA. And ultimately, they could be referred to the IRS and taken off of the, um, or attributed back to the taxes of the company that didn't pay them. Uh, but MSHA had roughly $60 million at the beginning of this administration in delinquent fines out there, and they made a big emphasis to go and collect those fines. Um, they are, you know, doing this through the Scoff Law Initiative, uh, and I think what's been surprising is in the last few months, companies that have, you know, maybe not had fines out there for years, but just for, you know, maybe the last quarter, um, whether that is intentional or by oversight because someone misplaced a document or you had a change of employees that maybe the person who traditionally took care of the MSHA fines is no longer there. 
uh, and didn't pass along that information. These are now being referred to the Scofflaw program and they are going out and actively you know, seeking operations to shut down until a payment plan can be put in place. Um, and the way they would shut down the operation is they would come out and they would actually issue you uh, a 104A citation uh, that says, you know, in the next seven days you need to take some action in order to make payment on these penalties either in full or create a payment plan. And if you do not do it within that seven days, they will come out and issue a 104B order, which is a failure to abate. And that failure abate order will affect the entire operation and will shut down the operation. Um, and now this is not the most, um, you know, this doesn't happen quickly. It goes through a process where you should be receiving a letter notifying you that you're in the Scofflaw program um, and that you have 30 days to respond. And again, this is only if you're missing all the payments coming up or opportunities to settle your debt with MSHA. So um, not a program that affects a lot of companies around the country, but nonetheless one that is becoming more of a tool that the agency is using. Um, and historically they have not. They have simply, you know, really put those penalties that were delinquent into collections and, and, and gone on their way. Um, now they are looking to really push back on that and get those companies who are avoiding or not paying their fines to either set up a payment plan or be shut down. Um, so it's something that you need to pay attention to if uh, one of your operations has any delinquent penalties. Um, and if they do, you want to very quickly uh, get in contact with them to, to address this concern. A continuing item is the powered haulage initiatives. Um, now, we probably remember this because we talked about it last year uh, on our mid-year review, and at that point it was just recently initiated, this power haulage plan or this power haulage initiative. And it continues to be one of MSHA's focus. Um, and it actually is, you know, something that we'll talk about here in a little bit on part of their regulatory agenda. So we very much are moving in the direction of having a new regulation on powered haulage. Um, again, this focuses on large and small vehicle interactions, haul roads, um, areas in the pit that it might be uh, where extraction takes place, seat belt usage, but it also includes conveyor belt safety. So it is a very widespread area at the mine. Um, and really touches almost all aspects of it. And these powered haulage plans, there's inspectors going out with emphasis um, or instructions to emphasize these areas of your operations, um, to be very vigilant in their inspections of mobile equipment or the safety procedures in place at a mine. Um, so we want to make sure that this continues to be something on our radar as well because it isn't going away from MSHA's side or their focus. And that's really because this is coming down from the Assistant Secretary. Assistant Secretary Zetezolo has you know, stated many times that powered haulage uh, accounts for roughly 50% of the fatal injuries in the mining industry on a uh, annual basis. And that has been the case for quite some time. So it is an area that he is trying to create new regulation and push the industry towards new technologies um, as well as, as more safety requirements. So we're going to see how that shapes, but right now it is somewhere that we definitely still need to be vigilant on because MSHA is going to pay a lot of attention to these areas of our mines when they're out on an inspection. Speaking of MSHA's regulatory agenda, Every year they release a spring and fall regulatory agenda from the entire Department of Labor, and that includes all rulemaking items or pre-rulemaking items that they are going to be pursuing. Um, the MSHA agenda this year is relatively light, but there are several items on here that we really want to take note of because they could potentially be very important. Um, now the first is obviously the initial item on the list, but respiral crystal and silica. Um, we're going to talk about that in another slide, but this is something that we were, you know, fairly confident there wouldn't be a rulemaking on uh, when a this current administration moved into MSHA, uh, but now here we are 
um, three years into the current administration and we have a pre-rule item uh, and a request for information coming out. Um, also important is down the second from the bottom, the surface mobile equipment or powered haulage safety program. And we're going to talk about that here in another slide as well. Uh, but there is a rule in place, as we talked about, on um, require, that may be requiring uh, the installation of power haulage safety programs. Um, another one of interest, though, is the fourth item down, and it says alternatives to petitions for modification. Uh, and this is specifically addressing non-permissible survey equipment. And the reason that this is interesting is less that it's dealing with non-permissible survey equipment, and more so that MSHA is looking at ways to modify and improve the Petition for Modification program. And the Petition for Modification program, if you're not familiar with it, is a way in which operators can go to MSHA and say, you know, I no longer want to comply with, you know, this standard. Um, because I have a better and safer way of doing this task, or I have developed some kind of procedure or technology that allows me to do this safer than complying with MSHA regulations. Um, and obviously, there's typically a, you know, component of that that this is, you know, also maybe more efficient for us, um, but in order to comply with the existing reg, we cannot do this new task. So the petition for modification, at this point, you have to file a petition, uh, you will have to go before a judge, uh, and they, depending on whether or not it is approved or not, which can take a, a long time, um, if it is approved, it may only apply to that specific mine. It, will, it may not even apply to the other operations that a company has, or and it definitely won't apply to other operations in the media area that have the same ability to implement the same technologies or the same processes. So. What MSHA is looking at doing, and they have been now for a while, is revising that petition for modification process uh, really as a way to try and jumpstart the updating of regulations. Um, they want to kind of use that as an avenue for industry to put forth new technologies and new processes that are going to allow them to more efficiently and more safely do their work. And in turn, MSHA would be moving on from uh, archaic regulations. Uh, so it's an interesting development. We're going to have to watch and see, obviously, how it goes and what changes, if anything, moving forward. Um, as you know, you all know, uh, the government uh, is a is a big ship to turn, uh, and a lot of times, by the time uh, an administration gets into this phase uh, where we are. Uh, you know, year three, they're starting to get their footing, starting to put out their regulatory agenda. Uh, you know, obviously everyone has seen that the campaign ads for the 2020 election have already started, so we are getting near a new administration possibly taking over. Possibly not. We won't know. We'll have to wait, though. Uh, but technically, or I'm sorry, typically, uh, the year before an election uh, is historically a pretty quiet year on the regulatory front. Uh, just because they don't want to ruffle any feathers. Um, so we're, we'll see. There's a lot of changes happening right now. There's some items in, uh, in movement, but we'll have to see what they look like if there is a change in administration. If there's not, we should probably expect a list on the screen right now to keep moving forward. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. Specific to uh, the first one we, item we talked about, respiral crystal and silica, uh, MSHA has put out a request for information. Now, a request for information is the first step in the rulemaking process, really, uh, where they are going to be seeking information uh, from the public and stakeholders in the industry on the most feasible ways to protect miners from exposure to quartz and respirable dust. Now, this is largely uh, been a topic that has really been pushed on MSHA, um, and I don't want to I don't want to mean that in that MSHA wasn't going to do this anyway prior to the administration change, but you know a lot of this information or a lot of the push on the silica regulation and the background information is already conducted in 
included in OSHA's rule that went into effect a few years ago. Now, at that point in time, uh, before the administration changed in 2016, uh, the expectation that MSHA was just going to adopt the OSHA regulation. Uh, when the administration change took place, that did not occur. And, you know, for a while, the system secretary, Zetezalo, was pretty reluctant to make any affirmative statement one way or the other on Siloka regulation. But what he did say was he referred to the testing, which showed that levels were largely in compliance for MSHA regulations, um, and that he needed to collect more data. This is part of that data collection, but it is a step in the rulemaking process. Uh, so a bit of a departure there. The largely, uh, one of the largest reasons for this change is that MSHA regulations um, and the threshold limit value that they use are based on a 1973 value or formula. Um, and that is something that a lot of, you know, obviously workplace safety uh, advocates and political advocates are grabbing hold of because, you know, it is now 2019 and we're relying on this 1973 value while OSHA has updated their regulation. So, you know, MSHA and OSHA currently calculate their exposure to levels differently um, and there's also different challenges in the mining environment, but we're going to see, you know, I anticipate that we're going to see some proposed regulation in one way, shape, or form um, in the next year or so uh, with this administration. And if we do have a change in administration, um, my guess would be that this will be, that silica is definitely going to be giving some, given a great deal of attention. So one way or another, I think that the mining industry needs to be prepared for uh, some updated silica regulations in the next, next few years. The other item that I, I mentioned specifically on the agenda was the powered haulage safety programs. Um, you know, and as I mentioned before, this is this is directly related to that 2018 initiative. Um, and you know, we are moving even forward beyond the the request for information stage. So we are now in the proposed rule stage, and that is what we expect to receive uh, sometime in 2020, uh, but, or maybe even in this 2019 fall agenda. Um, but last year, MSHA conducted a lot of meetings, as you can see from some screen, there's stakeholder meetings, and that was to collect additional information on uh, new advances in protecting from powered haulage. I think that the regulation, if it comes out, may have some requirements on the creation of a program. Um, and that that creation of a program could also include, uh, you know, quite possibly some mandatory requirements on new machinery that comes out with proximity monitoring systems in the metal non-metal industry, and particularly in the surface um, when we're talking about haulage equipment, whether it be haul trucks um, or front-end loaders or other uh, pieces of equipment like that, because there has been a, or at least several, uh, instances of runover and collisions in that um, sense, and you know that is a technology that exists and is on a lot of the new equipment, um, but it's not required in MSHA's regulations. So that would obviously have a lot of nuance um, that must be involved because what about all the older equipment? Would we, you know, would there be a requirement to retrofit? I think that would be stretch um, just from a feasibility and a cost standpoint um, with the rule. I think that would probably stop the rule before it began, but you might see some requirements that new equipment purchased or manufactured after a specific date must have uh, proximity monitoring systems. Um, also somewhat in this vein, um, but you know, it, it might very well be included in this, uh, is the industry at some point is going to really have a spike in, um, you know, call it autonomous, call it robotic, um, but most powered haulage vehicles where there is not a driver in the seat. Um, and I think that if there is a proposed rule on powered haulage safety programs, there may be some attempt by MSHA to begin regulation of 
robotic equipment um, or autonomous vehicles because right now they don't have any regulation on that. And there has been, you know, already a case on that front where, you know, it was determined that braking procedures were different with these autonomous vehicles because there is not an operator in place. Um, so the chalking and the parking brake procedures are going to already be affected by that. Um, so I think that there could be some, some attempt by MSHA to address the autonomous or robotic vehicles uh, in this program or in this proposed rule. But we're just going to have to wait and see what comes out of it um, in their next agenda, maybe in 2020. So if we kind of move forward, marching forward, um, I want to talk a bit now about changes at the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission. And, you know, for those of you who have, uh, you know, joined prior webinars, you have probably heard me talk about the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission. Um, and that is the, the third party um, that provides a adjudicatory agency or a forum for the Department of Labor and Mine Safety and Health, MSHA, and respondents or production operators and independent contractors to litigate. Um, so essentially, it's where we take our challenges to MSHA regulations. It is our first stop. So the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission is not part of MSHA uh, or the Department of Labor, although it was created with, uh, within the confines of the Mine Act, um, but it is a separate agency that is typically made up of a five commissioner panel. Um, and now for the first time, uh, well, in, as of March 2019, for the first time since August of 2018, the commission had a quorum again of commissioners. And a quorum just means enough persons on the commission to operate. Uh, and that is a minimum of three. So in August 2018, uh, some commissioners, their terms ended, and there were only two commissioners left, uh, which meant they could not rule on any substantive decisions. Um, in March 2019, three more commissioners were finally uh, affirmed and put on the commission, and we now have a five-commissioner panel. Uh, and that is the first time we've had a five-commissioner panel since, I believe, 2017. Um, so when we look at that, uh, the Commissioners are up on the screen right now. Uh, these will be our commissioners until August 2020. So we have another year with them. And that's important because there are a lot of substantive cases right now before the commission. Uh, and it is also sub important because for the first time uh, in nearly a decade or more, um, the commission is made up of a majority of commissioners that were previously involved on the industry side. Um, William Alton, Commissioner Alton, Chairman Reykjavik, and Commissioner Young uh, were all previously attorneys on the industry side uh, in some one capacity or another, either representing them um, in litigation with the agency as I do, uh, or being involved in the mining association world. Uh, Commissioner Trainer and Commissioner Jordan uh, were both previously uh, counsel for the United Mine Workers, so the labor side. This is an important distinction because for the first time, as I said, in almost a decade, uh, industry has a majority if there is a case that comes down to uh, a labor versus um, employer decision. And sometimes that is the case. These are political appointees. Um, so it's an interesting makeup. Uh, typically, or like I said, the last 10 years or so, the majority has been flipped the other way. So there's been a lot of 3-2 votes that went against operators. Maybe we'll see some changes on that. Uh, it's yet to be seen. They've released relatively few decisions, but um, nonetheless, this will be our commission for the next year. Um, Commissioner Jordan, Commissioner Young's terms right now expire in 2020. They could be put up for another term, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. But even if that is the case, um, right now we obviously know that the Senate is not moving very quickly on confirmations, uh, as our three commissioners that were just confirmed were up there for a number of months. Um, and then Commissioners Alton and Reykjavik are up uh, until 2024, and Commissioner Trainer until 2022. 
so we have some solid five years ahead of us with uh, two of our commissioners uh, and, and then three years with commissioner trainer and then we have a couple more that will be uh, off next year. Now it's important though when we lose Commissioner Jordan and Commissioner Young, even if they are uh, renominated or reappointed, uh, until they are confirmed, we will still have a quorum, um, and that will be an important element. So we will not lose the function of the commission, because the commission is who rules upon motions to reopen. If we miss a deadline for filing contests, uh, they also hear appeals of administrative law judge opinion decisions. Um, or interlocutory reviews of I'm sorry, of administrative law judge decisions. Uh, so they are really our first level of appellate courts in the amateur world. Now beyond them, you can go to this federal court system and all the way up to the Supreme Court if you really want to, um, or if the case demands such. But you know they are that first level of appellate review. So it is it's good to see that they have a full panel of commissioners again. Some cases that have recently come out, though, that are of interest for us. Um, the first is a, a Sims Crane decision, and this might sound familiar because there was <clears throat> a series of Sims Crane decisions the last few years regarding uh, suspended loads and what constitutes a suspended load. Um, this one is not based on suspended loads or focused on that, but instead looking at what is the requirement for fall protection. Um, and what happened in this particular case is Sims Crane had a delivery driver dropping a crane off at a mine site. Um, and an inspector drove in, saw the driver of the truck um, up on the crane, uh, and then descend from the crane and get, to, get down to ground level. Well, the inspector determined that that couldn't have been done safely without fall protection, so issued a 107A. Uh, imminent danger order, and then a citation. So <clears throat> it was taken before the ALJ. There was a significant discussion regarding whether or not the crane and its walkways and travelways and ladders complied with ISO requirements. Um, there is also a pretty significant review of a program information bulletin regarding fall, the use of fall protection on a mine site. Um, and the judge found that Sims Crane had violated this regulation. Um, now, when it was appealed, part of the appeal was whether or not the, first, whether or not the ALJ correctly found that fall protection was needed, and whether or not the ALJ shifted the burden of proof away from MSHA and to the mine operator, or Sims Crane in this case. Um, and that's important and, and an interesting element here because, you know, I know it doesn't seem like it a lot of times, um, especially when we're contesting citations, but if we go before a judge, an ALJ, with a case, MSHA has the burden of proof. They carry the burden of proof. They must establish that there was a violation by a preponderance of, an ev of the evidence. Um, and if they do not do that, there cannot be a citation. So. In this case, part of the argument was that the judge had shifted that burden away from MSHA, proving there was a danger of falling, uh, or a violation in this case, and instead put it on the operator to prove that there wasn't, or that the operator was in compliance. Um, and eventually, in the commission decision, that is what they found. They found that the judge inappropriately uh, or maybe mistakenly shifted that burden of proof away from MSHA and that MSHA did not carry the burden of proof. So as such, the citation had to be vacated. Um, this was a relatively new decision uh, in that it was just decided by the commission and published on July 11th. So you know, technically this could still be appealed by MSHA. We'll have to wait and see. Um, we have a few more days to do so, but right now it, it, it's an interesting, interesting decision, um, and it, you know, does, even though it was decided by the commission on this question of whether or not the ALJ shifted the burden of proof, uh, it still also looks at what requirements are there when descending from a piece of equipment, um, and in this case, uh, they found that there was not a hazard when 
present or MSHA failed to prove a hazard was present when the individual did not use fall protection when getting off of this loaded crane um, or loaded on a trailer. So as is sometimes the case, the commission can skirt around the question that industry really wants answered um, and find a way to do that while still giving industry, you know, the satisfaction of the citation being vacated, but we don't get a hard and fast rule that anytime, you know, someone's offloading equipment, you know, they do not have to wear fall protection. That was not the result of this. Uh, but nonetheless, it is some good case law looking at what is the burden of proof of MSHA and, you know, if we have a situation that aligns with what was taking place on the, in the Sims Crane case, uh, you know, you do have a defensive document for fall protection and working from heights um, in the future if you ever have any citations. The next uh, case I think that is relevant to us that came out recently was, excuse me, uh, the United Steel, Paper, and Forestry, Rubber Manufacturing, Energy, Allied Industrial, and Service Workers International Unions versus MSHA. And that is a mouthful, but it was a bunch of unions that sued MSHA based off of amendments to the 2017 workplace exam rule. Um, and so this is a very interesting case. In 2017, MSHA issued their final rule for metal, non-metal examinations of working places. Um, then, as we know, it, that implementation or the, that rule going into effect kept getting delayed. In 2018, MSHA put out an amended rule, uh, and this amendment removed really two distinct elements. Um, one, it changed the requirement that operators perform the work before miners enter a working area or before beginning work in an area to before or as. Um, that or as was the addition there. Miners begin work in an area, uh, so it gave operators a little bit of a break in that they could essentially conduct a, their workplace exam while miners were in an area. Now, I always kind of counseled companies and, uh, to be wary of that because I felt like it was a bit of a trap if uh, an incident or an injury was ever to take place. Uh, I always really encourage people, you know, best practice. I think you need to try and do these before. Um, if at all possible, before a work, uh, conduct the workplace exam before work begins or before minors enter an area. But nonetheless, the regulation gave you a little wiggle room there. Uh, secondly, there was the requirement that you record any adverse conditions that were observed during your workplace exam. And MSHA added a bit of language that said, unless it is promptly corrected and promptly corrected meant before any minor was exposed to it. So the example I always use is if there, and it's quite simple, but if there's a tool laying in a catwalk that you see during your inspection and you pick up the tool and put it on a tool rack next to it, um, under the previous or the 2018 amendment, you did not have to write a description of that condition on the report. So those were really the amendments that were, that were subject to this lawsuit, and they were, MSHA was sued over this because of really two reasons. One, the union said that the amendments to the 2017 final rule didn't offer uh, greater protection uh, or the no less protection clause, meaning that any change had to offer no less protection than the prior version. Um, the other side of that was that MSHA did not adequately justify their reason for making the amendments. And the appellate court found in the union's favor there. And so, you know, in doing so, they found that the 2018 amendment was unenforceable, um, meaning that it had to be vacated. So it reverted back and instructed them to revert back to the 2017 final rule for examinations of working places as its new, as its regulation. So what's that mean for us? As operators, we now are expected to comply with that 2017 final rule. Um, and I've been talk I talked to a couple people within MSHA recently, and they said they're starting to see some citations where inspectors are issuing for, you know, workplace exams that are not done before, but you know, are being done as minors enter an area. That is no longer permitted. Uh, additionally, you have 
to record every item. So if you do find that tool laying in a catwalk and move it out of the way, you have to record that on your workplace exam. Um, so a bit of the latter is a very arduous kind of requirement. I don't think that really, you know, helps safety, but what the DC Appeals Court found was that MSHA didn't adequately justify why they removed that. Um, so some immediate changes that have to take place and that we need to be cognizant of. Uh, you know, MSHA, surprisingly, has yet to comment on this really publicly or publish anything on it, uh, and, that, and that is a bit surprising. So, you know, we want to, you want to be aware that even though they haven't said anything, the court put this rule back into effect and we want to, you know, we want to be aware of that and amend our, our own procedures accordingly so that we're in compliance with the regulation. Because even if we are in compliance with the 2017 regulation, we are still in compliance with the 2018. We're just doing a bit more um, than the 2018 required. And if there is a question and an inspector is aware of this decision or their field office is aware of this decision, they could begin focusing on it. So. Uh, something to be aware of as you move forward with your workplace exams. Uh, also workplace exams is Sunbelt Rentals uh, versus MSHA, and this is a case that has been around for quite a while. As you can see, it's a citation from 2013, as you is indicated by the site up there, VA, meaning it took place in Virginia. Uh, 2013-0291, that is the case site. Um, so this is pending before the commission, again, for the second time. Uh, the first time the appeal was brought by MSHA after the judge vacated uh, citations against the production operator who owned the property, uh, and then a contractor and a subcontractor, which is Sunbelt. Sunbelt is a subcontractor um, that was brought on site in this instance to built scaffolding in a preheat tower at a cement facility. Um, MSHA appealed that initial judge's decision based on the fact that the judge said that there was no adequacy requirement in the workplace exam rule. And now at this point we have to remember that we're looking at that old workplace exam rule. Just that requires a workplace exam be done at least once per shift um, and recorded. The commission came back and said there is an adequacy requirement and remanded the judge to decide the case with that in mind. Um, the judge then found that Sunbelt uh, failed to perform a workplace exam in all of the working places. And what happened in this instance is a piece of material uh, fell from a higher elevation in the preheat tower than the employees of Sunbelt Rental were working while they constructed the scaffolding. Um, and it fell down and struck one of the employees. So what the judge said is that the Sunbelt Rentals uh, pre workplace exam was deficient because they didn't look at the entire working area because that would include above the working area. Um, and that is what is at issue or what is being challenged by Sunbelt on appeal. Um, whether the judge erred in ruling that a particular location in the preheat tower was a working place. Um, so we don't have a decision yet on this, but it is important because this is looking to possibly expand that definition. Um, so if we are working in an area, do we have to inspect every surrounding area that a change in that environment might affect ours? Um, and, you know, it's so in, in this sense, the question is, did they actually have to inspect the areas above where they were working? Uh, was that part of their working place? Because then when they were working on the ground floor in this preheat tower, that would, you know, mean that they had to conduct an inspection of the entire tower. It, it, removing it from that situation, you know, what happens when we're doing work, uh, you know, in an area of a mine where there's mobile equipment maybe going by, or where there's some sort of distinct crews, but maybe one is at an elevation higher than the other, and material falling at one could impact the other. Um, you know, that is, that is what this is seeking clarity on. To what extent do we have to search the areas that we would consider maybe an alternative working area nearby, but the conditions changing in that second area could affect the area we're working now. 
Um, so again, it's a bit it's a bit convoluted in following, but nonetheless, it's seeking to clarify what is a working place for the purposes of these exams. Um, because obviously, what MSHA is doing is applying a very broad definition, and the operator wants to have some more guidance on what specifically is included. A recent decision um, from North Shore Mining, and this was just released last week, so it's, it's very new, uh, and it could still be appealed by the company to the commission, but this was an ALJ decision, um, and it had to do with advance notice. And I think that's a, it's, it's an interesting case because advance notice is always something that operators ask me about and, you know, tell me their stories about MSHA saying that you can't call anyone because it's advance notice or you can't notify, you know, the people that I'm coming on site because that would be advance notice. So, you know, there are limitations to what are considered advance notice or what is considered advance notice under Section 103 of the Mine Act. Um, and in this case, an inspector came on site um, and someone got on the radio uh, and broadcast to the entire mine, you know, there's an inspector, can someone come up to a company and inspector? And when they did that, the inspector issued an imminent, or I'm sorry, an advance notice citation. And, you know, the intent was not to give advance notice and have everyone around the mine going on a, a fire drill to correct or cover up violations. It was just to notify someone um, that they needed to come up to a company MSHA. But nonetheless, what the judge found here was that the, the intent was not relevant because nonetheless, the individual had radioed on a site-wide broadcast that MSHA was there. Um, and that is specifically what advance notice seeks to avoid. So typically when I'm talking with, you know, an operator or a company, they ask me advance notice, I say, you have to be specific. You can call someone, yes, but you need to make sure that that text or call is going to a specific person. And I, you know, I often use the example that we do not want to get on the CB and call out to the entire site, you know, hey, Nick, come up to the office, MSHA's here or any other kind of hidden code on that. We want to make a very specific phone call to that person to say, you know, MSHA's on site, come on up to accompany them, and that is permitted. Uh, you are allowed to notify your rep, um, whether that's the operator's rep and or the miner's rep, but they do not want it to be broadcast um, so that everyone knows and everyone's, you know, the fear being that everyone's going to start climbing up, covering up violations or stop doing unsafe acts. You know, I'm not saying in any way that's what was occurring at this company, but that is the fear and that is the purpose of the advance notice uh, section of the act. So we need to be careful. This is something that, again, you always hear a lot of threats about, but you know you typically don't see MSHA move on it because it is a it's a hard item to, for them to prove. Um, but in this case, it went out to the entire facility. MSHA was aware of that. Uh, and it was a relatively straightforward citation in their minds, um, regardless of the intent, and the judge agreed with that. So last thing I want to cover on some legal developments is uh, there continues to be an interesting dynamic right now between the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission and uh, the Secretary of Labor for AMSHA. And part of that has been the American coal dockets that have been in litigation for years and just recently um, have been decided and, and moved on from in the last year or so. Uh, but those were having to go with regards to, you know, what justification does MSHA have to provide when giving a settlement? Um, the, you know, and in that case, MSHA kind of said, I, you know, we don't have to give you information, we're just going to tell you that this is the settlement we're agreeing to and the judge needs to approve it. There is a section of the Mine Act that gives the judges the ability or, or the right and responsibility to approve or disapprove of a settlement agreement. And that is really where the heart of this argument comes from. Um, MSHA and their solicitors want the judges to just rubber stamp a settlement because the operator and MSHA have agreed to it. The parties agree, approve it. Uh, the judges are pushing back that they need to have more information. 
um, and that is, you know, evolving. The solar sources cases um, have to do with, and so does American aggregates to an extent, and both are on appeal right now, um, have to do with the judges requesting additional information in order to approve a settlement. Uh, and in both cases, a judge, you know, wanted inspection notes or inspection photos in order to approve what the modifications were. And MSHA, uh, as counsel, the solicitor's office, refused to give them. Um, you know, they also bring into question what is MSHA's authority to unilaterally remove something from um, flagrant designations or special assessments after the fact, um, which they sometimes do in settlement because that is usually a large financial incentive to the company to accept a settlement. And judges are pushing back and saying, well, we need to know why you're removing this special assessment designation. And MSHA is, you know, pushing back accordingly saying we have decided to assign that and we have decided to take the special assessment designation away, you know, please just approve the settlement. Um, so there is, it's an interesting dynamic right now and it's an unfortunate dynamic if you're a company that's caught in the middle because now you're kind of just going on this ride um, where the judge won't approve your settlement. You and MSHA have a settlement agreement uh, in principle, but it's not final until it's approved. So now you're getting really drugged through this extended litigation uh, situation, uh, which, you know, is both frustrating, but also from an industry perspective, uh, gives the operators a, the opportunity to, you know, comment on this struggle um, and also give their input. But nonetheless, it can be extremely frustrating. I had a client who uh, we were nearly drawn into one of these uh, extended situations where MSHA and the judge did not agree, but we were able to work it out with the judge uh, at the last minute. So we didn't have to go through that, but that was quite fortunate. Um, but, you know, it is, it's something to monitor because conversely OSHA and the o Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission have gone the other way. They, you know, recently said that in a change of rules, we don't want to know about your settlement, just tell us what the terms are. Um, that's a bit simplistic, but, uh, you know, a summary of, of what their stance is. Meanwhile, on the mine safety side, uh, the commission is getting much more involved into whether or not they approve or disapprove of the settlements. Uh, so it's making life for the mine operators a little bit more difficult on the settlement side because we might go through the process of getting a settlement agreed to by the agency, uh, but then nonetheless might have it pushed back on by the commission judges. Um, so again, something that is, you know, affecting our litigation moving forward. So, you know, with that, um, I, we're, uh, we're at the end of our time. I appreciate everyone jumping on today. Um, information that we talk, discussed today, a lot of it can be found in, you know, blog form along with a recording of the webinar today on the uh, MSHAdefenseReport.com blog. Uh, so, you know, I encourage you all to check that out. Also, we have two more webinars for 2019, so I encourage you all to uh, join me for those and register. Even if you can't make it, you'll get a copy of the slides and the recording. Um, also, we are getting to that time of year where, you know, I'm starting to look at what we can put on the 2020 agenda, which is uh, still somewhat startling to say. So if you do have suggestions that are topics that you would like to hear about and like us to discuss on the webinars, I, you know, I encourage you to uh, either email me directly or in the uh, post-webinar survey, give a comment on uh, topics you would like to hear, and I'll certainly take those into consideration. Uh, all right, it doesn't look like we have any questions coming in. If anyone has any uh, questions that arise, uh, again, please let me know and uh, please reach out to me. I, I welcome the discussion. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a great day.